Good day, Clark. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Hi, you thank you so much for having me. I'm just so happy to be here. Would you please introduce yourself for our audience and give us a little background uh, about what you've been doing in the L&D world? Sure. I think the most important thing is I've probably spent more time working on educational simulations than anyone else in the industry. I think I've logged in more hours, you know, well past my 10,000 hour, you know, I'm probably in 30, 30,000 hours of, of my life spent working on, on simulations, both very, very complicated, intense ones and very uh, focused ones uh, that are a lot less intense. And, and, and so it's, I, I think I, I'm, really dedicated to this space in terms of number of hours. I've worked with all kinds of clients from military to nonprofit to government to, to uh, obviously cor corporate uh, America, uh, giant academic institutions. So I, I've worked with all of them. And I think it's, it's really important because every single one of those cultures has a little piece of the, of the of this of the solution. You know, every single part of these cultures has a has an insight into simulations that I've been able to draw from and feed back into and and affect my own work. So I'm someone who has a lot of scars, <laughs> lots of arrows in my back. Uh, you know, Game of Thrones level of of you know eyes gouged out and and spears in me and stuff. But um, but I think from all that, I think the the approach level we'll be talking about today is just a really nice, clean, elegant solution to a lot of these problems. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, now to our main event. Uh, first of all, on your uh, Short Sims website, it says that uh, Short Sims are a visual interactivity of a serious game, that it, uh, it has the focus and reusability of micro learning and the predictability of a traditional workbook. So before we get into uh, asking you to share an example of a Short Sim, can you tell us a little bit more what you meant by those three phrases? Sure. So I think we we were all as an industry really interested in serious games and how do we kind of create game-like experiences for education. I think all of us who grew up on computer games, uh, including myself, um, really likes the the visual flavor of them, the animation, the the responsiveness. You click something and things happen on the screen. You feel, you know, you have agency, uh, you, you know, you have all these sort of interesting systems and it's very visual. That's a, you know, the most computer games, you know, past Zork are very, very, um, there's a few people who get that reference, not many, um, uh, you know, are very visual experiences. And I think we're growing up in a, in a visual era. And, I, and one of my giant bugaboos is like war on words. How do we get rid of as many words as possible in our, in our e-learning content? No one wants to read words on screen. So a huge part of it is the visual interactivity of, of us, of a serious game. And also the way we display things, uh, you know, the, the language of a computer game, a little mini map in the bottom right corner of the screen, if we're playing a, a driving game or a first person shooter, you know, it's a really interesting way of, 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 of summarizing content. If you, if you use it well, I'll show you an example of that. So that's a really, really important thing. Um, another one is this notion of, of micro learning and most short sims are about 10 minutes long and 10 minutes is a really, really good number for a bunch of reasons. Uh, first of all, when you're making a short sim thing, it's about how long people are, are happy before they start getting grumpy, which is always really important. But 10 minutes is also something that we can share with each other. And, and by share, I mean, with, with colleagues and friends before, you know, if, if I'm going to send you a, a course and it's one hour long, you're probably not going to go through it. But if I send you something that's 10 minutes long, I say, hey, I'm really excited about this. Take a look at it. You, you might. Uh, and certainly, you know, I, I have friends who will, perhaps friends who won't. But um, and so this notion of focused content, this notion not of this giant sprawling thing, uh, I think we've built a tremendous amount of bad habits around online workbooks. Uh, this thing that sort of has been hanging over the entire profession, like a like an unwanted relative um, at a dinner party. And you know, I think we've we've, in a very very sad tragic way, we've we've built a lot of methodology around online workbooks. We've we've really we built assessment metrics around online workbooks. And no one no one ever says, "Ooh, I can't wait to do an online workbook today." No one has ever says, ooh, I made an online workbook today. I'm really, really proud of it. Uh, it's just, you know, and, and we just we end up throwing more and more production values and hey, this one's got video and this one's got really expensive formatting and this one's got social media interaction. This one's got badges and this one's got scores. And it's just, it's just all, we're just shoveling stuff one step. You know, it's, it's just how many ways can we perfume a pig? And so it's, it's, it's moving away from that in terms of the micro learning is, is a focus something. It's something that is, that is, 10 minutes long, you're in, you're out. Uh, it's about how much time you want to spend learning. Uh, and, it, and it does what it needs to do in 10 minutes. Uh, 
I mean, the last one that you mentioned is the the focus, the uh, predictability of an online workbook. Because towards your point, you know, there's a reason why the industry is awash in online workbooks. It's not because they're good. It's not because people like them. It's not because people are, you know, oh boy, I, I want to take an online workbook today. Um, but the reason we have so many of them is because they're predictable. They're, you know, they're relatively straightforward to make. If you say I'm going to do a course and I'm going to use an online workbook format, it's predictable. It's not going to break the bank. It's a very cost-effective way of doing that. Um, and so, so we have this sort of, sort of addiction, this, this lowest common denominator love of online workbooks because they're so relatively speed, cheap. The talent to develop them is relatively accessible, unlike AR, VR, unlike computer games. You know, it's easy to find someone who can, who can do a PowerPoint presentation, basically, with a few, uh, with a few uh, connections. Um, and so, so the, and, and it's easy to review. I mean, sponsors like online workbooks because you, you know, you, you say, okay, I got to make sure we've covered this content. Check, 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 check. Okay, good. We've covered that content. Sponsors love it. We have to develop content with sponsors in mind. We also have to develop content with lawyers in mind and lawyers, you know, often like to go through content and, you know, going back to that earlier model of serious game, lawyers hate going through serious games. They loathe it. Uh, it's very hard to get a, a serious game approved in, in most cultures. So workbooks are fabulous because they're predictable because the, the skill set we need to develop them is a fairly, is a, not, not an exotic one. Uh, and, and they're easy to, to deploy. I can deploy it to most people. I don't have to do checks for making sure you're, you know, you have the newest graphic card or the newest drivers or something. So necessarily for me to pull off the simulation thing, uh, and, and eventually leading to the methodology that I'll call short sims, it had to be something that was as easy and predictable and sane as an online workbook, uh, without any of the bad habits. And so that, you know, that was my own challenge is, is creating something that was that sane. Thank you. So you have a couple of examples or an example to share with us about a short sim is? Absolutely. And again, it's hearing people talk about them, including uh, me, perhaps especially me, is a pretty un, un, unsatisfying experience. So you really have to see me. So here's one I made. Uh, this one was for an organization uh, around hostile robberies in banks. And they had a traditional workbook and they just didn't like it very much. They asked me to, to do it. And so this is, I'll show you part of the, uh, the short sim. Uh, um, so the hostile robbery simulation. So uh, welcome to simulation hostile robberies. In the following four scenarios, you'll experience a variety of roles in, uh, around robberies. Okay. Um, let's start with you playing the role of a bank branch manager. Okay, so you're manager of a bank. It's Monday morning, a colleague called in sick, and you have a busy day ahead of you. You had to work early to open up the bank and get a few things done before things get too busy. Okay, simple situation. You're in a hurry. What do you have to drink with breakfast? So here's a, here's the first choice. You can practice the interface, coffee, instant coffee, or orange juice, uh, Pepsi AM, which of course is, is, would, would be my choice, um, or some other option. And so, I don't know, orange juice, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Okay, you have breakfast, you get in your car, and you drive to the bank branch. What do you do? Do you park closest to the door? Do you per park further from the door or do you just drive around the parking lot? Most people say, hmm, okay, nah, that's a stupid one down there. I'm going to park further from the door. I'm going to be a good employee. I'm not going to take up the, the, the choice spot. Um, bang. An armed robber who's been lurking by the side, side of the building grabs you at a gunpoint. The robber forces you to open the credit union and helps them steal thousands of dollars. So again, right there. This is a very common kind of kind of crime. Uh, I put you in the mood of, of an employee worrying a lot more about work and other things and thinking about it, even though this the topic of this simulation is a robbery sim. Uh, like 98% of the people, if, by the way, if, you're, if you know anything about security, the first thing you do, of course, is drive around the parking lot. So again, we can go back. By the way, if you look right here, there's a person lurking in the shadows right there. Uh, we're going to drive around the parking lot and bang, we, you know, we see a, a funny car. Uh, we, we, we call the police. That's the right thing to do. And, and they do it. So, so that's sort of the, the first scenario. And I'll just show you a tiny bit of a second one. So now it's Friday afternoon. You're a bank teller. Uh, you're helping the next person in line. He gives you a note. It's a robbery. I've got a gun. Give me, give me uh, $5,000. How much do you give them? The exact amount, less, more. Turns out if you give them less or more, they get really mad and can get violent. So you really want to give them the exact amount. Um, give them the bait money. Blah, blah. And so, and, and you know, you're aware of the smell of a smoke on the robber's breath and clothes. His hands are trembling. Your heart is pounding. So again, this is giving you a little bit of a feel for the situation. Uh, Robert drops the note and bends down to pick it up. What do you do? Well, let's use the opportunity to, to look for any details. Um, 
and off you go. And so then he r- runs out. And so it's a very fast effect. I mean, if you if you really have gone through on his robberies, it goes, it's over incredibly quickly. It's almost anticlimactic, at least hopefully it is, at least in this kind of, kind of situation. You know, the, the door shuts behind the robber. What do you do? Do you give instructions to the bank customers or do you lock the door? Well, the first thing we want to do is, is lock the door. Uh, we see him driving out. Um, and, we, and it can go on. So um, what do you tell everyone in the bank to do? Do you tell them to finish their banking? Do you tell them to leave now? Or do you tell them to stay where you are until the police arrive? And uh, again, if you get something wrong, leave now. It just sort of says, no, uh, everyone must wait to preserve evidence. So we go back to there. Okay, the right answer is, is preserve the evidence. And so, anyway, it goes on from there. So it's, uh, and it takes you through, um, it takes you through the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the interviewing process with the police. Uh, what you look for again, if you paid attention, you you did notice that the uh, the bad guy went drove north, and so the question, and one of the questions the police ask you is which direction did they drive? So you know it just gives you the experience of being in robbery. And then there's sort of two more uh, levels after that. One of a different kind of robbery, an evening robbery, and one of them is sort of a, an armed, you know, sort of the more dramatic one with the with with the big guns and the broken glass and people lying on the floor with their hands over their heads. So it gives you a very, you know, and, and again, the whole sim takes about eight minutes to do. It brings you through four common kinds of sim, uh, of, of robberies. Uh, you're making a bunch of decisions throughout the entire process of it. You're sort of engaged. Uh, it's not catching you if you do anything wrong. It's just sort of saying, oh, nope, that, that, that happens to be the wrong answer. Here's why. Try again. So it's a very, very much how we, 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 we learn in the real world. Hopefully, you know, you don't have to go through an armed robbery. The other nice thing about that one um, is that it does pull content. You you go through that simulation and the normal reaction is, wow, that really stinks to be in a robbery. What can I do to avoid this? Um, you know, h- how can I avoid these situations? All the situations like that first one are not only about what do you do in a robbery, but how do you avoid it? Um, and so again, like the driving around the parking lot thing. So it drives, it creates a situation where people really want to learn how to do the right thing. They, they're now interested in the topic. They feel like they have some experience under their belt. Um, so that if they do encounter it, they're sort of like, oh yeah, I've been here before. So it's a very nice situation. Again, it's not super high production values. It's all clip art. Uh, it's clip art that's been, you know, hopefully cleverly arranged. So it doesn't feel like clip art, but it is. Um, and you know that you know that one, that entire product took about forty hours to to, to build. Um, so it was not a you know hugely expensive situation. It doesn't look like one, but just you know that's how we learn in the real world. Thank you. Uh, that that was excellent. Uh, so my my next question is: uh, How do stakeholders? How have your stakeholders reacted to that? I'm thinking of sponsors and your your L and D client that may have hired you to do this on behalf of their sponsors, and then the learners themselves. So what kind of feedback have you gotten from those kinds of folks? Everyone loves them. I mean, it's just, it just feels so natural. And that's the thing. Uh, again, a quick ding on, on workbooks. You know, if you say, you know, there are seven things you should think about when you're in a robbery situation, everyone's just mind goes, no, I can't. And that's not how I work. I don't think about, you know, it's like, you know, we're going to teach you how to decline verbs or, 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 or conjugate verbs, sorry, um, or decline nouns. It's just, it's not how we learn. We don't learn, you know, bullet points are actually a horrible way of learning. We learn through experiences. And so the nice thing about it is um, these things are also not multi-path, you know, one of the early models we thought of in things like branching stories is how do we have three or four parallel paths and depending on some decisions, you're going down different paths of, of the thing. And it turns out everyone hates those. It turns out um, even though they're kind of clever to make uh, and they're, you, know, you can feel smart when, when, when you're actually grinding through them, it turns out every single group hates them. The learners hate them because they feel like they're missing out on a story. They've got to replay it a few times sort of to get the full real story or whatever. Sponsors hate it because it's incredibly hard to proofread. The designers, including myself, hate it because it's a real bloody pain to, to do. So you want to create a situation like the robbery sim that has a bunch of interesting decisions, but a very short feedback loop of saying, no, that's wrong. Here's why it's wrong. Let's go back to the main path. So as a result, um, everyone, you know, everyone likes them. The sponsors like them because they're cost effective. They're, 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 uh, sponsors like them because they're easy to review and proof. Uh, the users love them because this is, you know, this is just how they learn in real life. It goes down incredibly smoothly. Uh, and then, and then, you know, again, various lawyers and other things understand it because they can review it in a very timely way. It's not this, you know, this big complicated thing to review it. So, so far, um, all of the constituents um, for most of the things that I have made have been very happy with them. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, what, uh, what do L&D practitioners uh, need? Do they need different skills to create this or how can they get the most out of this? And 
And is there any special software or computer tools that are needed or that you would recommend? Tell us a little bit about this from the person who wants to test this out and try this. And I know you have a book on this too, so let's make sure we talk about that. Always happy to plug the book. Um, yeah, book's called Short Sims. Buy it now. Buy two. Um, they're small. The um, th There's two really easy tools to use, and one of them is called Branch Track, and one of them is called uh, the part of the iSpring suite. So um, that one that I showed you, I did, did an iSpring. I've done probably even more in Branch Track. So those are very good uh, tools. I think Articulate has uh, Rise, which is pretty good. It's not quite as fluid as the other two, uh, but you can get by them in a pinch. The whole design philosophy that to which I bring to bear, um, all this stuff is is uh, is, is non-proprietary. Uh, there's nothing about this that's that. There's nothing restrictive about this this approach to it. It's also technology independent. Um, it's a very lowest common denominator technology platform. All of those graphics, frankly, I mocked up in PowerPoint. I use I use PowerPoint for graphics, um, and all the graph people are going to wince at this point and put their hands over their head and say, "No, say it's not true." Um, you know, I'm happen to be superb with PowerPoint. I spend far too much of my life doing PowerPoint presentations, so I'm really good at making builds. I'm really good at at animations. I'm really good at um, you know, a bunch of static pictures that you sort of put one after another and you get a feeling of animation, you get a feeling of movement. Uh, and it's really, really cost effective. It's fast to create, it's fast to change. So I use PowerPoint as my, as my, with ClipArt as my graphics tool. Um, I use, um, again, iSpring and Branch Track. Uh, I have plenty of colleagues who, who also use Twine, uh, who also, again, use Articulate Rise, uh, who also use HP3. Uh, and, and again, my premise is that the, ability, the, the technology to do this is only going to get more and more ubiquitous as time goes on. So start off with any of those tools, but also keep in mind that I think we're going to have more and more options as time goes on. How long did it take you to put together a, a sim that's uh, 10 minutes in length? About 40 hours. So okay. the, average, the average short sim for me takes 40 hours to create from soup to nuts. And, and, I, and I do everything I can to make that a very efficient number. Um, and so it's not, you know, it's a, again... In a perfect world, you can pull it off in a week. In my less than perfect world, you know, depending on user feedback and stuff, it may, you know, maybe 40 hours over three weeks time to do it or for, you know, 40 hours over two weeks time. But it's, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, it's a very doable chunk of time. And does that include doing the upfront analysis and set, you know, setting the stage and understanding, you know, what the right answers are to the various paths that are presented? Absolutely. Um, that, that includes everything from, from handshake with the client, starting with the stopwatch to the final delivery there. Thank you so much. Um, one part of the, of, the, of the refining process, and again, it's a very refined process and hopefully the book covers it, but um, is also when you're doing your subject matter expert interviews, your primary question to your subject matter expert is what are common mistakes in this area? And so as long as you, again, you have a my, my work process is about a one hour interview with one subject matter expert, and then maybe another hour and a half poking around the internet. So that's about my, my process. Uh, if you focus on your SME and you ask that question, where do people make mistakes? Where do smart people make mistakes in this area? Where do newbies make mistakes in this area? Uh, so again, in that situation I showed you, a very, very common mistake is, you know, you get to work, you, you go in the front, you know, you go right in and, and you, don't, you don't think about surveying, surveying the parking lot. You don't think about doing a tiny bit of recon if you're opening up a bank. Another thing you can do when you're opening up a bank is go in pairs. Uh, it's, it's much harder to, to, you know, to do that morning glory robbery with two people instead of one person. So figure out all the common mistakes that people make and then figure out you know, clever and often devious ways of getting people to, you know, you don't ever want to have cheap shots. You don't ever want to have someone say, oh, that was an unfair, I made a mistake, but I never would have been in the real world. But you want to lure people into the feeling of the real world and, and get them and get them there. So uh, where is your book available? Oh, Amazon and hopefully at, at all the better conferences. Okay, excellent. Is there anything else that uh, you can add about short sims or and the... Uh, the approach that uh, instructional developer types uh, should employ when doing this before we wrap up? Well, I'd like to show you a few more examples, if I may. Sure. I think that, that may actually uh, answer your question a little bit. So here's one on the demand curve. So it's one of those horrible Econ 101 things uh, that we, uh, and you can see the demand curve, can't you? Yes. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, so this is one on, on teaching kids about the demand curve. So here's an experiment. 
Okay. Um, consider a food truck that's selling drinks. Well, wouldn't that be a beverage truck? Yeah, no, no, it wouldn't be. It's still a food truck. Um, so you have the ability to lower and raise prices of the drink sold. So right now the price of the drink is 50 cents and you can raise it or do nothing. So we're going to raise the price to a dollar. Now we're going to raise the price to a dollar 50. Great. So that's a nice little simple interface. Okay. We get the metaphor, uh, not too complicated. Okay. Now we're going to throw in some customers. Okay. Here's five customers at a dollar 50. And by the way, here's a little demand curve to actually show what we're talking about, which you could ignore, which I certainly do. So again, this is what I talked about. This is sort of a, this is based on a mini map situation in a racing game or first person shooter, giving someone a little mini map in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. So I can do nothing. I can raise the price uh, or I can learn a little bit about the demand curve. So we're going to raise the price. Okay. We raised the price. Demand curve went down. Uh, we're going to raise the price again. Demand curve, demand went down again. I moved on the demand curve. And so the price went to 250. I, I, I lost uh, there. Okay. So now I'm going to lower the price back down, get my full crowd back. Okay. Um, so now we're gonna wait for the sun to come out. Okay, so more people uh, want to drink at the same price uh, if the sun's out. Uh, I'm gonna wait for the clouds, and so I, I can do this. I can just click it back and forth uh, and sort of see what happens when 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 the cloud comes out. Um, you know, okay, uh, got it. Okay, so now here's a little lab. Uh, I want to create a situation where demand equals seven. So here's just a little tiny bit lab and I can, I can do these three things. I can raise the price as much as I want and get rid of all my customers. I can lower the price as much as I want, get tons of customers, uh, not make any money, raise the price, wait for the clouds, uh, wait for the sun to come out uh, and then find a spot where exactly seven people want to, want to buy a drink. So I'm going to lower the price lower the price. Okay, there, there. So now oh, this is, that's it. So, so it's just a little example. It's a little toy. It's a little fun way of banging around, um, trying to play with the demand curve, uh, understanding how demand curves work. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a nice, again, half the battle of that sim was kind of creating a good analogy. What's a good visual metaphor for the way to do it. Um, the client in this situation hated my first graphics. My first pass at graphics were sort of 2D blocky graphics. They hated it. Um, and they said, no, uh, can you do something a little more 3D? And so obviously I, I redid all the clip art in 3D form. Because I used PowerPoint, that was about a two hour process. I didn't have, there was no artist to hire. There was no, you know, committee to, to, to form. It's like, okay, uh, I'll give you better graphics. Uh, you know, give me a couple hours and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll redo them. So I can do them. So here's another example. Can you see Be a Hacker? Sure. Great. So here's a, a no graphics at all. Uh, you know, sort of, you know, what's it like to be a hacker? So let's do a thought experiment. Let's say you and I are hackers and, and we're going to steal some money. So, you know, hey, be bad guys. Great. So we stolen someone's password. They have $1,000 in their bank account. How much should we steal? Should we steal 1,000? Should we steal 500? Should we steal 50? Or should we steal nothing? So it's kind of, you know, that's, that's the setup. And most people say, you know, are going to like, well, let's steal 500 bucks. Uh, okay, that's good. We stole 500 bucks. They changed their password, but hey, isn't that great? Yep, and that's that's great. It's not bad, but we could have gotten more money because we're we're really evil bad guys. We we want to get as much money as we can. All right, I'm gonna try again. So most people then say, hmm, I'm gonna steal a thousand bucks. Let's just clean out clean out this sucker. We got their account. Hey, good, thousand dollars, right? Yep, great. Well, you know what? We could have gotten more than a thousand dollars. And now we're starting to think like a hacker, like more than a thousand dollars. How is that even possible? All right, I'm gonna try this again. And by the way, you can always say no, but all right, I'll, I'll try again. So now we start thinking about it. And if we play a little bit more, we can say, well, what if we steal $50? We stole $50 and the person didn't notice. Every other time the person noticed and changed the password. This time the person didn't notice. And now I can clean them out again. Or, hey, why don't we, we, we wait a month? Let's wait a month. Okay, we waited a month. Now how much we steal? You know what? Let's just steal 50 bucks again. Uh, so we stole 50 bucks again and we're going we're to wait again. And so, okay, the strategy is to steal a small amount every month. Bang. Well, that's how, that's how cyber criminals work. They don't go for the big haul. They don't like getting caught. They want to keep a thing in here. And this way we could make $1,800 over three years and keep that little spigot going forever. Uh, and that's how cyber criminals work. And it's a complete different thing than sort of in, than, than other kinds of criminals. So again, in this little tiny sim, this one took a lot less than, than 40 hours to make. Uh, no graphics, uh, you know, roughly 20 little slides. They're all text, no fancy graphics. Um, you can teach yourself how cyber cyber criminals work in a sort of in a, in a, in a very... A uh, profound way. Another one we did on um, on on COVID. Uh, so returning back back to the workplace. Okay, you know you you used to work at this kind of company, or you still work at the company. Uh, you're going to work. You you take your temperature first. Uh, yes, you want to grab your mask. Okay, you head to work. Um, 
Yeah, maybe the same building. Don't look at that too carefully. Um, park your car. Uh, you put on your mask when you get out of your car. And is it, you put on your mask this way? Nope, nose isn't covering. Okay, and work through it. And, and, and again, and then we'll pretty soon we'll go inside the building and we'll walk around and we'll use the elevators and we'll do all these things. And, you know, what is it like to do to do things? Show you one more short sim, if, if I may. Um, this one's all about growth. And so in this situation, you're a farmer. So we're going to, you know, uh, this is the, you're, you're, you want to grow your business. And you're a farmer, uh, and let's see how we do. And so, we're a farmer, and we can we can do one of two things each term. We can either plant strawberries, which is a plant a crop that we know about, or we can experiment with some less familiar fruits. That's sort of our, our big choice. Do we go with the do we go with the stuff we know well or not? So we're going to plant 100% strawberries that we know really really well. We can plant a half and half or all of less familiar fruits. So, what 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 do you want to do? Well, when I went through this earlier last week, I would choose, I chose two. Great. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to balance it and get great. So we have half the new stuff, half, half, the, half the, the old stuff. Uh, the season goes by and a bunch of our old stuff dies and, and our, our, our strawberries are doing well, but our, our new, our new assorted foods aren't, aren't doing so well. So most people are going to take it over from here. Say, you know what, you know what, I, I kind of want to make money and I kind of want to want to have my farm grow. So I'm going to start, well, I'm going to plant all strawberries since I know, I, I know my strawberries are, are doing well. Great. So my strawberries are doing well. Um, I have a few more little examples of my assorted fruit, but mostly my strawberries are thriving. Now I got one, I got another choice. Well, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do all strawberries. I'm going to, I'm going to focus on strawberries. Well, you know what? There's a massive drought uh, and all of my strawberries died and all I'm stuck or most of my strawberries died. All I'm stuck with are a few little scrappy things of, of things. And so, um, and so if, you know, and it could have been a, as a drought or could have been a strawberry glut in the marketplace. You could have suddenly, no one wanted strawberries anymore or soil depletion. It doesn't really matter what, what, what the thing is. The problem is, and, and, and all sort of, it's fine. this sim is about diversity and the sim is about the importance of diversity. And we all love the thing that does well, the thing that we're familiar with, the, the, the cash crop that does well, but always in organizations, the more we focus on a monoculture, the more we focus on one way of doing things, the more inherent vulnerabilities we work into our culture until finally we, you know, we hit a problem that we can't solve because we're, we're built around one thing. So it's a sim on diversity and inclusive cultures uh, where we're allowing people to play with the concept themselves. You know, even if you say, well, I'm an inclusive person, I'm all about inclusivity. A lot of people who, who self-describe themselves as, as inclusive still fail that simulation because their instincts still are, I want to go for growth uh, and I want to go for, um, and, and, and I want to, and I want to be, be predictable because that's what everyone wants. Right. And that's going to give me the, the best result. Uh, and so, um, and again, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and this one's just about taking, taking someone, someone through the, through the IPO process, which I don't need to, need to go through. So there's a bunch of examples. And again, hopefully what you're, you're, you're going to walk away with is sort of saying, this is a huge variety of approaches. This is not like, oh yeah, here's the one way of doing things. We can be as clever as we want. We can be as devious as we want. We can be as slippery as we want. We can, we can have things be high concept and big philosophy. We can have things be nitty gritty. Here's how to shuffle these papers so that you, you meet the, the needs of, of the organization. Um, but they all share a bunch of things in common. They're all very visual. They're all very interactive. Uh, they all have sort of a, a conversation with you. And hopefully you see them all and go, yeah, that, that's the way I want to learn that. You know, why isn't more stuff like that? That seems like a really fun way, a really powerful way, a really profound way of learning. And so, you know, the, these are not high production values. These are not, you know, giant videos. These are all incredibly easy to change. And so as one, re hopefully, if, if you, as you go through them all, you see, oh, those look pretty smooth. Those look pretty, not slick, but those look pretty frictionless. Uh, those have a nice feel to them. And the reason they do is because, you know, I, I create them in basically a wissy wig environment where, you know, you can make a little change and you see a little graphic that stinks. You go, oh, that, that, no, that, that was stupid. You can go through, go into PowerPoint, move the things around a little bit and re, you know, then, then, then re-upload it. And now you have it fixed. So this notion of, of very fast to create uh, means also that it's very easy to change. And the easier it is to change, as we all know, the, the easier it is that we, we make it better when we find a problem. And also we make it better, more importantly, when, when our clients find problems. Thank you for showing us those uh, examples. Those are from your website, shortsimsoneword.com. Um, and so, so I would invite people to go there and, and take a look and go through these yourself like I did last week. But let me shift back to the book again. So who is the book for? 
clients or is it for practitioners who have to create these kinds of things? What, what, what do I get from reading the book? The book is for people who create the stuff. The book is instructional design. Uh, it's a whole new philosophy of pedagogy around uh, learning to do content. Um, and and then before even going going down, I try to make one thing. So one thing is is if you ask a traditional instructional design person, someone who's in our business, how would you teach leadership? Most of them have a really hard time imagining how to do that in an online workbook form. But if you go through a bunch of short sims and now you ask that same question, you go, oh yeah, sure. I, I, I can put people in interesting situations. I can have them make interesting choices and I can have them see the outcomes. And so it opens up a tremendous amount of doors around all of these learning to do skills that we've always had to mumble our way through and not really tackle uh, head on. So the point being, and, and to tie back to the book, is there's actually an entirely new pedagogy around learning to do. What is the role of the coach? What is the role of, of mistakes? What is the role of a consistent interface? One thing that you may not have noticed is all most of those sims had a very consistent interface. Uh, one reason why, towards your earlier point about you know serious games, one reason why computer games are so much fun is because they have a consistent interface scheme where you you know you move your joystick up and you always move up and you move your joystick down and you always do. You don't have to think about it. And so for for me, a huge amount of the challenge of creating good short sims, how do you create an interface that people don't even have to think about? No one has to learn how to use any of these sims. It's the reason I use multiple choice over hotspots or more dynamic things. You know, all of your options are laid out in front of you. Uh, it's very, very clear. You're never confused. Um, I have a war on words, as I said. I like to trim down words to the absolute minimum so you have the most interactivity. Uh, the less words you have, the more people will, 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 will play your sim. And more importantly, the more people will, re will replay your sim a couple of different times. Uh, which is which is very satisfying to watch. Um, you know, how do you? I don't say how do you trick people, but how do you? You know, in something as as seemingly obvious as a multiple choice interface, how do you slip slip people by? And hopefully, you saw that with the um, with a couple of the examples. I you know, the hacker sim simulation. I'm sneaking by something hopefully pretty profound. Uh, certainly, the robbery sim. I'm I'm sneaking stuff by, but in a way that feels very fair. It's not again. It's not a cheap shot, but it's a way of allowing someone's bad habit from life to to seep over in, into the sim in a way that no professional would ever would ever fall for. So, there's a tremendous amount of new pedagogy. Um, you know, one of the big profound observations is, you know, this, I have this coach character and the coach is there to help you along and it's your friend. It's not, it's not the person you're trying to negotiate with. It's not a zero sum or something who's your adversary. This is your friend. This is, this is, this is your Jeeves. This is your Jarvis. This is your, this is the person who's there to, to assist you and, and help you out and how profound that is in creating an experience that is, that's fun. That's enjoyable. That, 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 that's satisfying. You know, how do you make these things be some place where people want to spend time? So it was entire pedagogy, but sorry, one thing I, I learned along the way is sort of the best metaphor for this coach character is again, Jeeves and Jarvis come to mind, uh, obviously sort of the, the gentleman, gentleman, but even more profoundly, it's sort of an acting coach. Um, if you, if you've ever done an acting workshop, which oh, by the way, I haven't, um, you, um, you know, that acting coach has a very specific role in terms of setting the scene, setting the challenge, breaking the fourth wall, asking, you know, why you're doing things that you're doing. And it's a very, you know, interesting collaborative experience. And that ends up for me being the perfect role model um, for it. Um, all of the sort of the, the visual cues. So the book goes into it in, in, in uh, hopefully very accessible detail. Um, all of these little things to think about and in a recipe in terms of here's how you make your first one. Uh, and then here's how to sort of expand from there. And then ultimately to think about how many different things you can do because it's, it's the, the, the worlds that we've opened up in short sims, the worlds that we can now cover boggles the mind. And so I think we're just at the beginning of this just massive revolution of content. Art, many thanks for sharing with all of us with us today. Um, I will put the appropriate links in the show notes. The best wishes for you and short sims in the marketplace. I'm really excited to be sharing this with people. Okay, thank you so much. What a real pleasure and honor to be here. I really do appreciate your, your time and your interest and thoughtfulness in, in, in this and also in, in everything in the industry you've done. So thank you. Cheers. Cheers.